something that happened in 1926 a year before ambedkar became a legislator a year before he undertook that mahad struggle of his something stupendous happened in madras presidency and nobody knows about it i'm the first one to bring it to light i did a couple of books uh, earlier focusing on uh, mass violence targeting minorities and the first one happened to be against the congress government and the second one against the bjp government so in that sense i am uh, in american parlance an equal opportunities offender and there must be something that you like about these guys no at least the fact that they are acting as catalysts for you guys to write books like this something <laughs> that you like well i i agree with you ee maharajyathile oru cheriya vibhagam janangal mathram samsarikkunnadana ende bhasha pakshe njangalude bhasha sajeevam chalnaatmagamana so the first thing is you know you're a journalist at the core of with all these things you're a journalist you are also a researcher you are you are you are also finding the time to research about a topic and bring out a book about it are you part of a dying breed am i part of a dying breed yeah i would uh, on the contrary think that it is actually a growing breed because uh, journalism as a uh, with so many other sectors has uh, got so um sort of poisoned uh space for uh, serious watchdog journalism investigative journalism is uh, shrinking uh, and uh, media organizations especially mainstream media organizations are being uh, far too cautious or uh, they have been uh, compromised uh, so it's not a space uh, that uh, warrants uh, any independent uh, journalism that uh, retains your integrity so many of us uh, over a period are uh, uh, disenchanted and uh, there is this uh, trend of uh, people moving out of uh, journalism moving out of either mainstream journalism and moving to smaller platforms or um, there are people like me who have uh, moved into book writing uh, in the process sometimes uh, entering the domain of uh, academics as is certainly the case uh, with the book uh, that i recently did caste pride battles for equality in hindu india it is uh, essentially legal history of caste so this is something that uh, ideally should have been done already by academics especially historians but uh, for some reason this intersection of law and caste was neglected and i as a mere journalist ended up doing this and coming up with this book in the year 2023 yeah on that note you know it's uh, you got your first award in life recently i i think yes. you know, <laughs> and yeah, so what for this very book at yeah. the bangalore lit fest so what why do you think what took you like so long to get your first award uh, it's only for my third book that i got an award uh, my earlier books Uh, were about uh, mass violence targeting uh, minorities uh, the first one was about uh, the 1984 carnage the title is when a tree shook delhi the 1984 carnage and its aftermath and it came out uh, when uh, congress was very much in power it was uh, during the manmohan singh government and uh, uh, i don't know what the reason was uh, uh for uh, that not uh, getting uh, any such recognition but i may tell you that uh, it uh, the book as such did very well it has run into several reprints and uh, it uh, led me to uh, the honor of uh, speaking at uh, uh, how many uh, three parliaments um, british uh, canadian and the us uh, parliament so uh, and then the next book was uh, on the gujarat carnage it's titled uh, the fiction of fact finding uh, modi and godra now this came out uh, in the run up to the 2014 election when uh, there used to be a great, uh, great deal of intolerance to anything uh, uh, even in uh, the media space coming against uh, modi or coming against uh, his role in the uh, 2002 carnage because they were very insecure about uh, that project of uh, 
elevating him to the prime minister's seat uh, being uh, you know endangered so they uh, at a time like that this book came out and uh, it was ignored i mean nothing happened but then this uh, 2023 book uh, i'm grateful for the fact see not, not that i was driven by this desire to win awards so I, this is a tweet uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, made it was not something that i put out I, to the world yeah. so i'm nevertheless grateful for the fact uh, that uh, this book uh, received such recognition and i had this opportunity of speaking on this book uh, at several places in india and abroad so it's great and quite a buzz it's an extensively researched book it's it's got a lot of you know the footnotes itself were like quite long a hypothetical question about you know if india colonizes mars or moon ever do you think we'll export cars there also well that's a good question uh firstly let me clarify while i did uh, uh ensure or spare no effort to ensure that uh, uh this book is uh written with a great deal of rigor and i gave uh, proper references uh, after all it is essentially based on um, either to unexplored uh, legislative and judicial archives going back to centuries uh, that is how there is a wealth of new material on uh, the intersection of uh, law and caste but uh, as far as the other question is concerned about uh, the prospect of uh, india uh, exporting caste is concerned that is already a reality uh, this was something that uh, ambedkar famously said uh, that uh, you know caste is such a deeply ingrained prejudice in hindus that uh, if they uh, migrate to other countries there is every danger of uh, their carrying uh, this uh, malaise this social evil of caste with them and there's evidence from the fact that uh, at least two countries have uh, undergone a great deal of churn on this question of whether they should uh, uh, recognize uh, caste discrimination as uh, uh, something that uh, is affecting their society too and uh, uh, a few years ago britain already passed a law but then uh, on the quest on uh, i mean introducing a provision against caste discrimination but there was such a pushback uh, from uh, caste in those that it was subsequently aborted uh, even after the enactment it was aborted it never came into force and in um, us not too long ago uh both houses of uh, california legislature um with a uh, you know very resounding majority passed a law against caste discrimination but then uh, the governor of uh, the state uh, uh, though he is a democrat uh, came under pressure from uh, several caste hindu groups and uh, vetoed it uh, this is uh, late uh, last year and uh, there is one place though where uh, it has uh, become a law but only at uh, the level of the city council um, that is in uh, uh, the city of seattle uh, thanks to uh, a left uh, a politician called uh, shama uh, savan uh, who incidentally is an upper caste uh, woman a brahmin herself uh, but she uh, fought against all odds to get uh, that law against caste discrimination enacted in uh, the city council of seattle and that's part of a pattern i noticed in these uh, battles for equality in uh, hindu india this is how i put it for the reason that these battles were essentially fought uh, between two sections of hindus uh, while orthodox uh, hindus were predominantly upper caste um, and including of course brahmins the liberal conservative hindus were not necessarily lower caste in fact in the early decades a lot of them were in fact um, upper caste because lower caste uh, at the time did not have access to legislative and judicial spaces so there were a lot of people from upper caste sections although they were beneficiaries of it they could uh, uh, see it for what it is that it is a, a deeply discriminatory and oppressive uh morally untenable system and they have uh, fought against it and uh, in varying degrees of success uh, uh, we are benefiting from their uh, struggles yeah. the book is about the legal history of uh, of the caste 
do you think the law really cares about or the courts really care about caste discrimination and stuff like that and yeah. also uh, despite this being illegal in india and to a larger extent does the society care about it? your question actually takes me to the genesis of this book um, as i said earlier i did a couple of books uh, earlier focusing on uh, mass violence targeting minorities and the first one happened to be against the congress government and the second one against the bjp government so in that sense i am uh, in american parlance an equal opportunities offender uh, i was driven by uh, my concern for uh, the sections of people who were uh, affected whose human rights were violated very grossly for no fault of theirs uh, because of this politically motivated violence and uh, similarly i wanted to do a book on uh, uh, mass violence targeting dalits and the difference this time was going to be that there is actually a special law uh, seeking to deal with the caste atrocities so i wanted to deal with with this conundrum of uh, why there is so much impunity for uh, cases relating to mass violence targeting dalits despite this so called uh, draconian law and uh, that led me to this discovery that in case after case some arm or the other of the indian state be it the police uh, prosecution uh, trial court or uh, appellate court would uh, be instrumental in uh, uh, exonerating uh, the culprits on the flimsiest of grounds there was clearly a structural bias so i wanted to understand where the structural bias was coming from but none of the existing books or literature on the subject gave me an answer to that because some of historians missed out on this intersection of law and caste they didn't deal with the legal aspects of caste so i had to do that research myself go to archives and uh, dig out all this material and i went uh, way beyond my comfort zone i really entered the domain of uh, academics and this is by default why do i say by default it's because ideally academics should have done this work but since nobody did it i ended up doing it and a lot of discoveries i make about you know huge uh, achievements relating to uh, the struggle against caste relating to social justice which we know little or nothing about some huge uh, you know inflection points watershed movements completely went uh, unreported in our history books they come to light for the first time through the work of a mere journalist in the year 2023 and that's because of this uh, you know neglect on the part of academics please give us like one or two examples just to illustrate this point yeah for instance uh, you know when was uh, the silence on untouchability broken in parliament or what was called uh, imperial legislative council in uh, and this took place in the year 1916 it was done by a little known legislator who was neither a congressman which was the dominant party then nor even a hindu the community that is directly concerned with the problem of untouchability it was an unknown uh, legislator from central provinces called manik ji dada boy uh, uh, he was the one who raised this issue and that uh, led to a series of uh, developments uh, one of which was that uh, in the madras the then governor uh, Wellington now here is another unsung hero you know not all unsung heroes are indians not all unsung heroes are lower caste people some unsung heroes are upper caste people some unsung heroes are non hindu indians and some unsung heroes are actually british administrators so wellington was the first one to have appointed a dalit to the legislature he in fact adopted the route of nomination recognizing the fact that there was little chance of dalits uh being able to get elected you know the uh, electorate was very limited only educated people or property class were voters then so he adopted this route and after that in the the government of india act of 1919 the reforms that are called montego chemsford reforms this was institutionalized so as a result of which several uh, dalits became legislators even uh, through that provision of nominating dalits somebody like ambedkar became Uh, legislator in uh, bombay presidency for the first time in 1927 now i want to tell you about something that happened in 1926 a year before ambedkar 
became a legislator a year before he undertook that mahar struggle of his something stupendous happened in madras presidency and nobody knows about it i am the first one to bring it to light and what is that the first ever law against untouchability anywhere in the country was passed in 1926 and what is even more significant about it is that this law was uh, thanks to the drafting and uh, piloting by a dalit legislator imagine the kind of odds he would have had to face to be able to enact this law to be able to uh, you know sell this proposal to uh, a, a legislative body that is dominated by apakas right now that man is r virayan against all odds he succeeds in passing that and nobody knows about it at all nobody knows about that law nobody knows about the stupendous role played by a dalit legislator so such are the kind of uh, yeah. huge uh, the gaps that i feel in the history relating to caste legal history of caste or legal history of social justice we yeah. actually have an island named after willington but for entirely different reasons yeah right. that uh, last two questions one is about you know so much of what you are talking about is related to history do you think people uh, kinds of um, think that history started yesterday or you know in live their daily lives like history started yesterday yeah i mean i do see this tendency on the part of people to fall prey to suggestions that uh, caste is a thing of the past and whoever says so is obviously speaking from a space of privilege they are only betraying their uh, uh, you know very privileged status uh, it is a situation where uh, there were lots of struggles that took place in the past and those battles are far from over and it is on account of those unfinished battles that you still see the problem of untouchability uh, bedeviling our country it uh, rears its ugly head in all sorts of uh, unforeseen unlikely situations in rural india and even in urban spaces in uh, education institutions in centers of excellence you know uh, or why is it happening because we never exorcised this monster we never confronted it with the earnestness it deserved so we have never had that kind of as a society as a collective we have never been remorseful enough so it still continues this gives an example of like just like what you said somewhere caste that you don't expect caste to have an influence on but somewhere For instance, like- let me tell you uh forget about untouchability because at the end of the day it affects only a small section at the bottom of our society now let me cite the example of intercaste marriage now people across the board engage in intercaste marriage yet so few know or hardly anybody knows that till not too long ago intercaste marriage was strictly forbidden the attempt to introduce a legislation in this space to legalize intercaste marriage and to legitimize the status of the children of intercaste marriage was made for the first time in the year 1918 by none other than vital bhai patel who was the elder brother of sardar vallabh bhai patel and there was such a push back against uh, this much needed reform from the hindu right the hindu right of the time which is different from the hindu right of now because uh, rss was yet to come into existence that was born only in 25 i am talking about something that happened in 1918 so the hindu right then was within the congress fold which was a big tent representing all shades of opinion so there were people like madan mohan malviya who very fiercely very vehemently opposed this i am talking about somebody who is still a hero for the hindu right within the months of uh, modi coming to power at the center he conferred the bharat ratna title to madan mohan malviya so you can imagine how much uh, you know Uh, he is still a source of inspiration to today's generation of uh, hindutva activists right so now this is the role he played he was opposed to something that we today take for granted to be a desirable reform we know nothing about it and it took 30 years of struggle finally in 1949 when it became untenable for these orthodox hindus because they would be exposed they can't any more uh, lay the blame on uh, uh, the colonial administration it will become evident that this reform was being blocked by 
Hindus, Orthodox Hindus themselves. It was not because uh, the colonial administration was stopping it, right? So in 49, soon after India becomes independent, it is enacted. And uh, with unanimity, all those fears that they, these very sections expressed earlier about uh, this being uh, violative of Hindu ethos and Hindu value system, they all evaporated. They all disappeared because they know that it's uh, inexpedient. But then it doesn't mean that there is any remorse, that there is any change of heart. As is evident from the fact that uh, a recent survey showed that no more than 5% of uh, Indians or Hindus engage in uh, intercaste marriage. And even now, when intercaste marriage, uh, marriages take place in progressive states like uh, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, there are incidents of uh, honor killings where the parents of the runaway couple themselves are seized with such, uh, uh, you know, caste frenzy, that prejudice, that they kill their own children. So you can see that this is still a reality and this reality persists because we don't even know about these battles. So subconsciously, we are uh, all complicit in this caste prejudice being still so prevalent in our society. I think what comes through in my three books is that right-wing popularly we associate with, uh, say, the Sangh Parivar today. But if you look at our history, that tendency of uh, stoking majoritarian prejudices or uh, whipping up this uh, hatred towards minorities was something that was betrayed even by sections that are today perceived to be on the left. 1984 riots, or it's actually a pogrom, you know, 2,733 people are officially admitted to have been killed. And this admission came years later. Right? right in the capital of the country, right under the nose of the Rajiv Gandhi government. And a fortnight later, he has the gall to justify it by saying that when a big tree falls, the earth is bound to shake. And he milks this uh, carnage for electoral purposes. And he wins a kind of mandate that nobody before or after got. Right? So this is what emboldened uh, BJP at the time. Uh, clearly their thinking was, if you can be so opportunistically communal, we can play this game better than you. Because after all, we are supposed to be ideologically communal. And that is how they took up this Ram Janmabhumi issue in the tenure of Rajiv Gandhi in uh, the second half of 80s. And today we are speaking in the run-up to the inauguration of that very temple, right? So uh, you can see how these are all interconnected. But is there anything that you, I mean, there must be something that you like about these guys, no? At least the fact that they are acting as catalysts for you guys to write books like this. Something <laughs> that you like? Well, uh, I, I agree with you that uh, they make a great copy, but I want to underscore this fact that, uh, you know, there are questions to be asked of uh, people across the political spectrum. Uh, people have, uh, uh, you know, exploited uh, these uh, communal and caste fissures for all sorts of uh, political reasons. Uh, there is much to be uh, said about all sides. And uh, yes, um, most certainly uh, in today's context, uh, the party that has been in power for the last 10 years is uh, uh, going to be more accountable than others. One final question about, since you come from the world of journalism and you have been a journalist for long, like, is in today's India, sir, like, a set of journalistic rules for the BJP and another set for the rest of the uh, uh, political spectrum, Do, is, it, is it how journalism works today? Yeah. In another way, well, I don't know if there, another are, phrasing, if, like, there are, if it is codified as rules, what has certainly happened is, that in the years I used to be uh, writing extensively uh, on the, the cover-up of uh, uh, the truth relating to the 1984 program, I did not uh, encounter uh, the kind of pushback I did when I was uh, re reporting extensively on the 2002 issue. Something had changed. The environment has certainly become more uh, intolerant. Uh, the journalism space. Well, uh, they are more susceptible to pressures and uh, it's not just about journalism. Even uh, 
uh, other institutions, institutions of the rule of law, uh, are uh, more um, dodgy on these issues. They have uh, a record of coming up with uh, decisions, passing orders that, enti that don't entirely add up, that are suggestive of uh, their being influenced uh, by extraneous considerations. So it has certainly become uh, far uh, more difficult and far more risky today to go against the grain of uh, the dominant uh, narrative. Uh, so where do you get your news from? Do you believe the written word printed in newspapers? Well, uh, the book I'm uh, referring to just now, as is the case with my earlier books too, what I essentially depend on uh, are primary sources. So my earlier books were, were based on judgments, commission of inquiry reports, prosecution uh, statements and official testimonies and so on and so forth. Now this book is based on, as I said, legislative and judicial archives and uh, judgments. You know, some of those were never reported. You know, something relating to Belchi case, which is otherwise so well known in the political context. That's the case in which Indira Gandhi very famously went on uh, top of an elephant to reach a very inaccessible village and uh, you know, give some assurance to the victims of a caste atrocity near Bihar, Belchi, right? But that is all we know. History Historians say that uh, that marks the beginning of her comeback trail. This happened in 1977, soon after she lost the election of 77, right? But nobody knows what happened in the legislature. There were some amazing things that happened. The way several Dalit legislators rose above their political affiliations and forced the government of the day, the Janata Party government and the Home Minister Charan Singh to apologize for making some misleading claims about that atrocity. And then all that led to uh, the legal process uh, taking its uh, course uh, very seriously and leading to uh, the first ever and the only ever instance of a killer of Dalits being uh, given death penalty at the highest level, that is in the Supreme Court, and his being uh, executed and by neck to death. That's the only ever instance, uh, Belchi. So such are the nuggets that uh, this book comes out. Uh, so I had to, uh, you know, struggle a great deal to unearth these documents. You know, like how? For example, okay. for example, for example, I had to move heaven and earth in the archives of uh, Patna High Court to get access to this, uh, uh, somebody like uh, Justice Chandru, um, uh, a legendary judge from Madras High Court, known for his uh, deep engagement with social reform, was helpful to me in um, unearthing uh, details from the Supreme Court archives on, uh, say, the first recorded instance of caste violence, Kilven money, or even uh, Belchi the Supreme Court judgment. I got to know only through... Uh, what was the status of these archives when you visited them? You said. Well, uh, one wouldn't... Um, uh, unlike uh, public archives, uh, like national archives or state archives, which are accessible to scholars, but I don't get access to the repositories themselves. I would have to sit in the reference room and uh, look through the index and uh, give the reference number of that record and that will be provided to me on a temporary basis. I have to see it there uh, to ensure that the document itself uh, doesn't get damaged and it goes back, right? In the case of these uh, court, uh, uh, you know, registries, uh, records, record rooms they are called, they are not normally called archives there, you don't get access to them. You have to approach them through some judges or some lawyers and if they are kindly disposed to you, they help. I have a very extensive note of acknowledgement because it really took a village for this book to be written. I, it took seven years of uh, you know, research and writing for this work to come out.